Today we'll be talking about trial by the Sanhedrin. This is the second trial, okay? But let us start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you once again. We have an opportunity to study your word. We pray that your word will be embedded into our hearts deeply because your word, O oh Lord, will become the foundation upon which we lay our life. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So where are we so far? Let's do some uh, revision. <clears throat> okay, uh, so far we are in the portion of the chapter 1 to 7. All of this is in Jerusalem. Uh, in the chapter 1, we have looked at introduction, which is Luke writing to Theophilus. We have seen the ascension of Jesus. We have seen the choosing of Matthias. Uh, and we have compared it with the choosing of the 7 in chapter 6. We have seen the story of the day of Pentecost. We have seen the sermon by Peter, how 3,000 men uh, was added that day. We'll see twice in chapter 2 and chapter 4 uh, about the life of the early church. Of course, the chapter 2, we already seen how they sell their possessions in giving for the poor. In chapter 4, they introduced Barnabas to us which led uh, to the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Chapter 3, we have the beautiful gate, another Peter's sermon, 5,000 men was added. Chapter 4, we had the first trial uh, when Peter and John, after the incident of healing the lame man at the beautiful gate, they were tried by the Sanhedrin council. And their response on that day was to pray for boldness. So we are now at chapter 5. We have seen Ananias and Sapphira trying to do what Barnabas do, but with some deception uh, sown in. Uh, after the death of both of them, there were fear. They were uh, they were fear among the believers and among the people outside. But because of that, even more people begin to believe. So today we're going to continue this part of the story. Uh, which is the next few chapters. So Ananias, Sapphira, we have seen already. This is selling their field, counting their money, but choosing to lie and keep some behind. Uh, so they lied to the Holy Spirit, therefore they dropped out dead and were spared. Uh, their story in Acts chapter 5 ended uh, with a verse 16 that said, many uh, before verse 16, many miracles and people were fearful, but people were, were, were saying good things about them. Many were believing. And in verse 16, it says, And the crowds of people came in from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing those who were sick or who had evil spirit in them, and they were all healed. You see in verse uh, chapter 1, verse 8, we see the uh, progression that you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem. And next would be this Judea and Samaria. So where is this? If you look at the map, <clears throat> Jerusalem is here, right in the middle. Um, so the regions or the towns around Jerusalem will be probably towns like Bethany, uh, Bethlehem, and Maos. All these towns begin to have people coming to Jerusalem. So you can see that the progression of the story now is to exceed Jerusalem into all of Judea and Samaria. So this is where we are uh, going, uh, where the story is leading to. Now, <clears throat> tonight, we're going to talk about the trial. There will be a second trial, not the same as the first one in chapter 4. Uh, this is the second trial, even though many things are similar. Uh, but when we answer questions, we must understand that these two are separate events, okay? So, let's go right into Acts chapter 5 and verse 17. <clears throat> so, this was after verse 16, okay? This was after this story. So, verse 17. Then, the high priest and all his companions, members of the local party of the Sadducees. Remember Sadducees? Um, in fact, Pharisees and Sadducees, again, are religious differences, religious belief. They have their own belief system. They are separated. 
But if we look at these two parts, uh, chief priests and the elders of the Sanhedrin Council are mostly, both of them, mostly Sadducees. So in this verse, it says that uh, the high priest, which is the leader of the chief priests, and all his companions, so we are assuming these people are the chief priests and the other elders, members of the local party, this one, party, local party of the Sadducees, they were extremely jealous of the apostles. So they decided to take action. Verse 18. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But that night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison gates, let the apostles out and said to them, Go and stand in the temple and tell the people all about this new life. The apostles obeyed and at dawn, they entered the temple and started teaching. So this is the, uh, the first story uh, in Acts <clears throat> where it tells us that an angel of the Lord came to the prison, let the apostles out, L let them free, set them free, uh, and they were free to go. So the, the surprising thing is that no one actually noticed they were missing. We'll read on later on. But I also want you to notice, if you're a student of Bible knowledge for SPM, that there are multiple cases of angels coming and setting uh, the believers free from the, from, the, uh, from the prison or from the jail. I want you to be able to identify them and see that they are distinctively different stories from one another. Okay, so this is the first one. Angels, 12 apostles, set them free trials by the Sanhedrin. And what happened was that <clears throat> they went next day to the temple because the, the, the angels said, go and stand in the temple and tell the people all about this new life. The apostles obeyed and at dawn they entered the temple and started teaching. So yet yeah, uh, in the previous lesson, we learned something called the Sol Solomon's Porticles. So if you see this being highlighted by yellow, these are all the porticles. They call them the Solomon's porticles. It looks like this, okay? It's an open air uh, area where anybody can join in. Uh, anybody, anybody can hear them. And so they were around this place talking about this Jesus. And you know what? Some historians tell us that the Sanhedrin's council meeting place was somewhere around this corner, the lower right corner. So I'm not sure how true that is, but if it is true, you will notice that they are very nearby. They are probably standing around here, very near to where they actually meet. And continuing in verse 24, the high priest and his companions called together all the Jewish elders for a full meeting of the council. Again, which council is this? The Sanhedrin council, made up of the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law. So they were having a council or a trial, with trial today, and they sent orders to the prison to have the apostles brought before them. But when the officials arrived, they did not find the apostles in prison. So they returned to the council and reported. Verse 23. When we arrived at the jail, we found it locked up tight and all the guards on watch at the gate. So everything is normal. The, the jail are still locked, the doors are still locked, the guards are still there uh, protecting this prison that's empty. But when we opened the gates, we found no one inside. And verse 24. When the chief priest and officer in charge of the temple guards heard this, they wondered what had happened to the apostles. Did they just disappear into thin air? Then a man came in and said to them, Listen, the men you put in prison are in the temple teaching the people. So the officer went off with his men and brought the apostles back. Wow, how, what funny story this is. They were right there waiting for the apostles and the apostles was out there teaching about Jesus. But I want you to notice this last sentence here. They said that they did not use force, however, because they were afraid that the people might stone them. Such an interesting statement. 
I wonder whether they already know that they are fighting against the people of God. Right? So let's read on. Okay? Verse 27. <clears throat> they brought the apostles in. Oh, I forgot to show you. This is where uh, they would probably meet something that looks like this. The Sanhedrin council. So the council is ready. The scribes are ready. Uh, but the people were not. So as they brought them into this place, they brought the apostles in, I think 12 of them, made them stand before the council, again the Sanhedrin council, and the high priest, which is the leader of the Sanhedrin council, questioned them, we gave you strict orders not to teach in the name of this man. When? When did they give them strict orders not to teach in the name of Jesus? In chapter 4. In chapter 4, during the first trial, the Sanhedrin council warned them strictly never to preach in Jesus' name. Of course, the apostle says, uh, you tell us, should we obey you or should we obey God? We cannot stop preaching or telling uh, what we have seen and what we have heard. So they are referring to that case now. Uh, they say, he said, the high priest said, but see what you have done. You have spread your teaching all over Jerusalem. Wow. Within just such a short time that they have spread the, uh, the gospel all over the town. And not only that, here it says, you want to make us responsible for his death. What are they talking about? Um, they always say, that this is the Jesus that you killed. And here, verse 29, Peter um, re, uh, said all over again in verse 29. Peter and the other apostles answered, We must obey God, not men. A repetition. The God of our ancestor raised Jesus from death after you had killed him by nailing him to the cross. So this was their message. And the Sanhedrin council were not happy because they were made responsible for Jesus' death, which in, 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 in all logic and reality and truth, they did. Okay, they did. Verse 31. God raised him to his right side as leader and savior. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, to give the people of Israel the opportunity to repent and have their sins forgiven. <clears throat> We are witnesses, remember, witnesses to these things. We and the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to those who obey Him. <clears throat> Verse 33. When the members of the council heard this, they were so furious that they wanted to have the apostles put to death. Now, I want you to remember that the Sanhedrin council does not have authority to give the death penalty. They do not have the authority to give the death penalty. The highest penalty they can give is uh, just one step short of putting people to death. That is why when Sanhedrin council wanted to put Jesus to death, they had to bring Jesus to Pontius Pilate. So they wanted to do the same thing now. Uh, just as uh, they have done to Jesus towards these 12 Apostles. But in verse 34, but one of them, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. Wow, I'm going to introduce you to Gamaliel soon, but let's read on. Gamaliel, who was a teacher of the law and was highly respected by all the people, stood up in a council. He ordered the apostle to be taken out for a while and then said to the council, Fellow Israelites, be careful what you do to this man. You remember that Judas appeared some time ago, claiming to be somebody great, and about 400 men joined him. But he was killed, and his followers were scattered, and his movement died out. After that, Judas the Galilean appeared <clears throat> during the time of the census. He drew a crowd after him, but he also was killed, and all his followers were scattered. You notice the similarity? He wanted to show that the followers will scatter, all right? And so in this case, I tell you, do not take any action against this man. Leave them alone. If 
what they have planned and done is of human origin, it will disappear. But, but, but if it comes from God, you cannot possibly defeat them. You could find yourself fighting against God and the council follow Gamaliel's advice. Um, I want you to introduce you to this man called Gamaliel. <coughs> Gamaliel is a Pharisee. Uh, so he is from the uh, belief uh, group that believes in the Torah, the whole book of the Old Testament, believe in the oral teaching, believe in resurrection, believe in angels and demons. So he was not just a Pharisee, he was also in the Sanhedrin council because he was a teacher of the law. Now in Acts chapter 5 in verse 34, we read just now, he was a man that's highly respected by all the people. Later on in Acts chapter 22, Paul said in his testimony that he was a student of Gamaliel. So you can see that Gamaliel is one of the uh, important people in this court. Now what did Gamaliel say? Gamaliel gave two examples. He mentioned Judas and Judas. He said that Judas claimed to be somebody great as 400 men, but when he was killed, his followers were scattered. And then he said the same thing about Judas. Also drew a crowd after him, but when he died, in both cases, both their followers were scattered. What he's trying to say is this. He's trying to give a warning to the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> Be careful what you do to this man. In this case, I tell you three things he's mentioned. Number one, do not take any action. Leave them alone. Remember, they wanted to put them to death, right? They wanted to put the apostles to death. And here Gamaliel says, no, no, don't take an action. Leave them alone. Secondly, he said, if what they are doing is of human origin, it will automatically disappear. It will just and just as Jesus died, Jesus' movement will end. But number three, if it comes from God, you cannot possibly, possibly defeat them. You could find yourself fighting against God. So Gamelo gave this very good advice. I have no idea uh, by what or what reason he gave this advice. But because of this, <clears throat> they didn't go on with their plan in putting the apostles to death. In verse 14, they called the apostles in and had them weep and ordered them never to again to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they set them free. As the apostles left the council, they were happy. Very surprising. Huh? They were happy because God has considered them worthy to suffer disgrace for the sake of Jesus. Wow, what a response. And then what did they do? Did they take the, uh, the warning and stop talking about Jesus? No, in verse 42, and every day in the temple and in people's home, they continued to teach and preach the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. Wow. <clears throat> so let's look back. When they called them in, what did they do to the apostles? I was told that this weeping was the 40 lashes minus one that Paul talked about. It means that it is one of the highest punishment that can be given. Now, I'm not sure. Now, even if it is not, okay, even if it's not, even if it's the basic beating, it will have been a painful experience for all of them. They had them weep. They ordered them again never to speak in Jesus' name and then set them free. But the apostles' response is such a weird response. If Imagine if you were the one who were put to trial today. You stand before Malaysian court and they beat you up and say never to talk about Jesus what would our response be? I hope that one day I could be able to respond similar to how the apostles responded. They were happy 
wow, I would probably be angry, depressed, sad, disappointed with God. But they were happy. Why? Because God had considered them worthy to suffer disgrace for the sake of Christ. Wow. Does God find us worthy to suffer disgrace for Jesus? And what did they do? Every day in the temple, they didn't hide away. They were there in broad daylight in the midst of everyone. And they did the same thing talking about Jesus. In the temple and in people's homes, they continued to teach and preach the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. Wow. Wow. Such an amazing. I want you to see how consistent they were. Remember, in chapter 4, they had their first trial. And now we are in chapter 5, we are looking at the second trial, second time. In the first trial, <coughs> the council warned them strongly. The second time, they whipped them and warned them strongly. The first time, their response was they prayed for boldness. They prayed that God will move and heal. They prayed that God will grant wonders and miracles. And they continued to proclaim God's message with boldness. They continued to be witnesses with, in all boldness. And now their response was very consistent. After being whipped, they were happy because they were worthy to suffer disgrace. And what do they do? They preach good news every day in temple and the homes. Wow. And this is where we are right now. So the next time we come back, we want to finish chapter 7. There's one last part, which is the story of Stephen. Uh, because we have already done the choosing of the seven previously in our previous lesson, I'm going to go through a little bit of this story and then talk about Stephen in the next lesson. And we can conclude the story in Jerusalem. So this is the trial by the Sanhedrin. But before I close, I want to leave you with one verse from Romans chapter 8, verse 18. It says that what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that God, that He will reveal to us later. I hope that we can have this mindset. That the Word of God has told us clearly that what we suffer is nothing compared to the glory when Jesus comes again. We pray that we will endure until the very end and that we will be faithful to God all the days of our life. Let us pray. Lord, we have seen this story about the persecution towards your apostles and the hope of Christ. We pray that in our own life, even if we face tribulations and persecution, we will not lose heart. We will not be discouraged. But Lord, we will rejoice when we are persecuted, when we are persecuted uh, for, for the sake of you, O oh Lord. We will rejoice because we remember that in the future, the glory that you will reveal to us is way, way more amazing and worthwhile compared to the sufferings that we will suffer shortly in our lives on earth. So we pray. Give us perseverance to go through whatever that you have allowed in our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.